When you get Inca and you become a Jita Popesnim, one of the things that you have to do is re-examine your relationship to Kanga practice. You have to, I, for me, I've had to really look deeply at the practice of Kangans and ask myself, you know, what's, what is the point of, what is the, what is the point of Kangans for myself? And what is the point of Kangans when I'm asking them of a student? Um, and also, um, as a teacher, I've had the chance to experience that some students um, don't like Kangans or some students feel confused by them or uh, some students don't quite get the point of them. So I actually thought that tonight I would talk a bit about uh, what Kangans have done for me over the years. Um, and uh, um, I, I have six, six points and I'm not gonna get all to all of them, but, I'll, but I'm gonna say the six points and then I'm, and then I'm gonna jump in. So, so the point number one is that Kangans give, an, give, give us an experience of not knowing. Um, uh sorry just scanning down um number two they give you an opportunity to see your karma arise that's happened for me a lot um number three uh you get the chance to match another person's mind that is to say you have to perceive your teacher's mind and match your mind that's something that you have to do a lot in life um you get number four is a lot of our kangans are um, our teaching stories about somebody getting enlightenment. And so you get a lot of times in kangans the opportunity to embody somebody else's enlightenment experience. And so experience that moment for yourself. Um, uh, number five is that it becomes an experiment. The kangan interview is an experimental space. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what happens in the interview room. So you can really experiment with different ways of being. And then the last point is that sometimes a kangan can present a life conundrum that reflects a life conundrum in your life, but it's kind of clarified and purified and detached from uh, your life circumstances. So you get to examine it in a really pure way. So, so I came to Zen originally because um, I was just confused by life. Like I was like, where's the owner's manual? How do you like, you're supposed to choose what to do for a living, but how do you choose? What's the criteria on which you choose what to do for a living? You know, you're supposed to get a life partner, but how do you, what's the criterion by which you choose what, what life partner to have? Like, how do you, how do you figure any of this shit out? And I was really, you know, um, either really stuck or really alive with that when I came to the quantum school of Zen. And um, I went, um, uh, I went for interviews with Zen Master Song Young, Bobby Rhodes, who used to have practice upstairs in her house in Providence, Rhode Island. And I would go every Tuesday night. And um, uh, I remember going in and she um, uh, read, she had me read this poem out loud, which I bet a bunch of you have read. It's called The Human Root, right? So The Human Root goes coming empty handed, going empty handed, that is human. That means we're born empty handed and we die empty handed. And that's the fundamental nature of being human. When you are born, where do you come from? When you die, where do you go? Life is like a floating cloud that appears. Death is like a floating cloud which disappears. The floating cloud itself originally does not exist. Life and death coming and going are also like that. But there is one thing which always remains clear. It is pure and clear, not depending on life and death. Then what is the one pure and clear thing? So when Zen Master Sung Hyung asked me that question, my mind stopped, right? So I had all these ideas about first of life, there is life. <laughs> That's one idea I started with. Then there's uh, what do you, what do I do with life? So I I had this I idea, this life idea. So this whole construction of ideas, you know, that I was wanting to get to the bottom of. And when I went for this interview, she said, "What is the one pure and clear thing?" Right. And 
there is this way in which at that moment, my thinking really could not help me. Just like my thinking could not help me with these big questions I had, you know? So there's these moments in a Kangan interview where you get asked a question, you, ah, thinking cannot help you. And getting to a point where, for me, where I am comfortable in living in the space where thinking cannot help me has been a really important part of my Kangan practice. Because even the very reason why I came to Zen was because I could not stand the not knowing. Like, what am I supposed to date? <laughs> you know, like I couldn't stand the not knowing, right? But in Kangan practice, all the time, I'm thrusted back into not knowing. As I was thinking, it's a little bit like a, you know, if you know anything at all about alcohol, alcoholism, as I do, I know, in fact, way more about alcoholism than I really would have chosen to. But anyway, um, um, uh, there's this, it's suddenly you get this nice feeling, right? And then you're like, oh, I want a nice feeling. I want a nice feeling. Keep chasing after this nice feeling. And you build a life around getting this nice feeling and start to cause problems for yourself. And then eventually, if you're lucky, there's some sort of an intervention, right? And your family come together and they all get in a row and tell you how much you think you've hurt them. And then hopefully you, uh, ah, ah, this doesn't work. And then hopefully you go to rehab and then maybe AA and then you get sober. So there's this kind of intervention where the, this house of ideas that you've built up suddenly is cut and I think Kangan interviews are kind of like interventions for thinking, right? Where, you know, so I create, I get this nice feeling when I get what I want. So then I spend a lot of time, to, like oftentimes they say, you know, I'm supposed to be doing something. I just don't know what it is. <laughs> and then I think, well, how do I figure it is what it is I'm supposed to be doing? Well, I should just do whatever it is that gets me what I want. So that means I'm supposed to want something. <laughs> the only problem is I just don't know what that is either, right? So, so there's this whole construction. And but then a Zen master comes along and says, What is the one pure and clear thing? And for me, if I if I look at that, that question, I've answered that kung on. That that kung on, it's not so hard to answer but it takes our whole life to truly attain that kanga. What is the one pure and clear thing? And if I can attain that kanga, then moment to, by moment, my life becomes clear. And the answers to all my questions are clear moment by moment by moment too, right? So, so, so one thing is we get a moment of not knowing, you know, and learn to be comfortable with not knowing. Um, so point number two, you get to see your karma arise, right? So every situation in, that I have in my life, sometimes I don't approach it so clearly. I approach it through the lens of my karma. And um, there is a, a, at a certain stage in my Kung An practice, I was basically just wanting to tick them off. Like yeah, tick, 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 that one out of the blue cliff record, that one out of the moon and quan, that one out of whole world, single power, good, good, good. And uh, I didn't like it when the momentum came to a standstill. And there's this one particular Kung An, it's the 49th case in the Blue Cliff record uh, called uh, Samsung's uh, Golden Fish. I think I can't remember quite the title, but Samsung goes to Solbong and he says, so Samsung has been recently made a Zen master. Solbong is a old and wise and Zen master. And Samsung goes to Solbong. He says, I wonder what does the golden fish who has passed through the net use for food? The golden fish that passed through the net, that means like a, you could say it means an enlightened person. So what's, what does, what does a, an enlightened person use for support? Solbong says, when you get out of the net, I'll tell you. That means you don't even need to know. You're when when you're an enlightened being, you'll find out what supports enlightened beings. Samsung comes back and he says, "The teacher of fifteen hundred people, and you can't answer a simple question. Like I don't like that Dharma combat style answer you gave me." And then Solbong says, "This old monk is busy taking care of the temple." That's the case. The first question is, 
Um, uh, if, if you were sold Bong and Samsung came and asked you, what does the golden fish who has passed through the net use for food? What would you say? That's the first question. The second question is, who won the Dharma combat? So I passed those two questions. I was working this Kung on with Paul Maichek, Peter Popesnin, so I thought, tick. And then I went in to interview with Zen Master Joe Kum, Ken Cassell. And so he read the case, he said, let's do this case. And he said, read it. And I was like, I was kind of like, yeah, okay, sure, we'll do that case. <laughs> because I had passed it with Paul Maichek, Peter Popesnin. So he asked me the two questions and I passed them. And then the Zen Master Joe Kum says, says uh, he says, all of that aside, when the when that when the case is op- over, he says, what happened to the net? And I was like, in, in my the, what 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 I said to him is, well, I, I well, I don't want. Let's just say I said I stuffed it somewhere is what I said because I, I was actually angry. I, I was not really angry, but. I was angry because I wanted to be done with the Kangan and I didn't want more questions, right? I did not, I wanted, I wanted the tick mark. So that happens, I've that happens a lot in Kangan. As a teacher, you see, you see, you know, students' habitual hindrances. When I'm doing Kangans, I see my habitual hindrances. So so you get to see, like, oh, this is this is what's clouding my vision in 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 the interview room, but also in my whole life. Right. So I'm not going to say so much about this, um, but but uh, I was doing training interviews. So when you you get Inca, then at first you sit with another more senior teacher or senior teachers while and you give in either. Sometimes they do the interviews and you watch them. Sometimes you do the interviews and they comment. Anyway, I was sitting with Terry Cronin, to Pope's name. And a student came in and uh, Terry asked the student a question. The student gave an answer and Terry shook his head like that. And the student said, but so-and-so passed me on that Kung on. <laughs> this is another thing that can be really annoying for students. And Terry, Terry said to him, well, you matched so-and-so's mind. Now you must match my mind. Right. So when I was um, when when before I was a Jita Pope's name, I would uh, at fr- in, in the olden days, not not in recent years, but you know, I would also become annoyed if I answered to a teacher and uh, another teacher had to accept it. And the new this other teacher wouldn't because I thought that um, everybody should have the exact same answer to the Kangans. Right. But actually, what's really going on is the. The, there's the the student's job is to perceive the teacher's mind and match their minds and answer in an appropriate way to the relationship and to the situation. In other words, in that moment when that teacher asks the question, it's not what's the right answer. It's what's my correct situation, relationship, and function in that in relation to this particular person, right? So. Uh, that to me is really interesting because we have to do that all the time in life. Like your old boss loved it when you, I don't know, typed a long report. Your new boss wants a one paragraph summary, but but my old boss loved it that way. That's like the same as, but the other teacher passed me. It's happening all the time. So how do we, how do I see through my karma and my objections and actually be with the person, the teacher who's in front of me? Um, so uh, point number four, you get to embody somebody, some some experience that somebody has already had. So I love this little Kung on. It's, it's kind of simple. I'm going to read it to you. Um, uh, but I, but I use this Kung on often. Um, it's deceptively simple, and and uh, I'll, g- I'll even give you a little hint. Students answer it automatically because they think they, oh, I know that answer, and then they answer it, and that's not the answer to the kung on. So, so I'll give you that little hint for free. Um, this is number 97 in Whole World is a Single Flower. And it says, one day, Mangong Sinim was drinking tea with Zen Master Su Wal. In the middle of their conversation, Su Wal picked up a teacup and said, don't say this is a key teacup. Don't say this is not a teacup. What can you say? 
Mangong answered correctly, so Su Wa was very happy. And then the question is just simply, well, how did Mangong answer? So this is one of these cases where Mangong is a Zen master, and you, as the student, are asked to, to uh, embody the Zen master. That means have a Zen master's mind at that moment. I mean, we all already have Zen master minds. I know that. But this, for me, is another function of Kangans, that where we actually... There's some some way of matching the the teacher's mind, and we do it in kangans, and then it's like riding a bike, right? You start to use that kind of experience starts to become more habitual for your mind. So there's that. Um, uh, another thing about the kangan interview that I like is that it's a it's a risk free experimental space, and if you think it's not risk free. As I often did, I thought there was risk involved. If you think it's not risk free, that's your karma. Because all that's happening is you're going in a room with your friends and your friends asking you a question. And then you're feeling all, I mean, your teacher, you know, it's not quite your friend, but for the most part, it's your friends just asking you a, a, a question out of an old book, right? And either you're going to get it or you're not going to get it, or you're going to have a don't know experience or you're not. And then it's going to be over in two minutes. It doesn't matter, right? So so it's a real place to experiment, right? So we, we, we with students, I'm often, when students answer, sometimes you'll ask a question to a student, they say, say um, if you were Mangang and, um, and, and, uh, and your friend held up his tea, teacup and said, don't say it's a teacup, don't say it's not a teacup. What can you say? If you were Mangang at that moment, how would you answer? So sometimes you'll see a student goes, like, and then they go, and then they give you an answer. My advice to you is straight away, hit, right? Hits like pressing, pressing clear on a calculator. And then maybe at that moment, some intuition can arise in your mind, right? And then you can be spontaneous and it doesn't matter right or wrong. Part, part of Kangan practice is getting the experience of spontaneous answering, like, and answering, like it doesn't matter, just answering without attachment to whether it's right or wrong, because that's how we need to live our lives. Because when we attach in our lives to right or wrong, that's when we suffer. That's when we cause suffering for other people. And then the last point I'm gonna make before we move over to questions is, um uh is um uh that sometimes the uh, zen experiences uh, sorry kangans can reflect a situation in your life so years ago i wrote a book about world war ii and i i interviewed a lot of people for this book uh 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 veterans uh uh who had been operatives behind the lines in in france and they were severely traumatized by their experience. And I probably had secondhand PTSD from talking to so many of them. And um, Zen Master Xiang Yang had come to New York to lead a retreat. And she was talking about some veteran that she'd been working with because she was a hospice nurse and she called him a hero. And this upset me because I, I have a lot of compassion and love for veterans in general. But just because someone's in a war, to me, didn't make them a hero because I had heard about so many acts that were not heroic in war. So when I went in to interview, I challenged the Zen master. I said, you know, just because someone has carried a gun doesn't necessarily make them a hero. And uh, 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 she said, where is this coming from? And I actually, I told her a story that I had read in, it's a book called The Things They Carry by Tim. You guys are going to, somebody's going to know Tim. I'm forgetting his last name, but it's, it was a Vietnam book. And in the story, uh, this story, what happens is basically there's a platoon of soldiers. One of the, one of the platoon has been killed by a sniper. And uh, the sniper, they believe the sniper has been being protected in this particular village. And so they go down to the village with the intention of, finding the sniper and killing the villagers. But when they go down to the village, village, all the villagers have left. And the only living creature in this village is a baby water buffalo. And so the best friend of the guy who had been killed uh, 
went to the baby water buffalo and shot it in each of its legs, shot, just shot it in different places, none of which would kill it, only to torture the water buffalo. And then they took the baby water buffalo and they threw it in the well to poison the water in the well forever. And this had really hit my mind. It was, I remember, I think I probably cried in the interview. I said, why are people like that? Are people good or bad? Are people good or bad? And Samrasha Song Yang said, I have a Kung An that I think is really going to help you. So she said, a hunter walks into the middle of a field. Overhead fly two geese. The hunter reaches back, gets an arrow, pulls back his bow, fires. The first goose falls down dead. Said, but there's still another goose in the sky. So the hunter reaches back again, but there are no more arrows. All the same, the hunter pulls back the bow, releases with no arrow, and the second goose falls down dead. And then Zemester Sung Young said to me, Why? So that was the Kung. It was like, Why? To me, it was like, Why did those? Soldiers do that to that water buffalo. It was a big why question. And working on that Kung An really, really has helped my life over time. Have been stuck on it for a long time and working it with the Zen Master Song Young. Anyway, those were my little thoughts about Kung Ans. I thought I would share. Um, I, I one thing that I that to be frustrated with Kung Ans is it means that means you're alive. You of course. Because we're frustrated with life, you know, that I heard one of our teachers, I can't remember who said, if you don't like Kung An's, you don't like life. That's true, because Kung An's, you know, there's the power dynamics at play, there's the frustration at play, there's all the things, there's, there's also the not being comfortable with not knowing at play. We don't know, I, we, we just don't know, right? That's our job, to be comfortable with not knowing and allow our loving, compassionate nature to spring forth without needing to funnel it through some understanding. 